place for lost children. You say, oh, I know what to do. You take him there. These people are used to lost children. The people who lost the child will call them because they know that's where the lost child is. And that's how children who are lost are found. You have people who volunteer uh, medical supplies. You can, you can get medical supplies like blood pressure equipment or uh, uh, blood uh, sugar testing or wheelchairs or crutches or, or um, baby equipment. All of this free of charge. You can use them when you need them and you return them. This is because the community has a commitment. People in the community have a commitment to improving the life of the community. So when you talk about the anticipated cost, one has to take into, about, into account the anticipated benefits as well. And I think, when you balance them up, to think of it as a significantly difficult disruption and difficulty in my life where the cost is going to be enormous, I think that for most people that's going to be unrealistic. Of course, if in your spare time you're running guns to the Palestinians, you'll have to reconsider that. That's true. That's true. And if you really are addicted to cheeseburgers, double bacon cheeseburgers at the local McDonald's, then you will have to wean yourself from that cholesterol full of <laughs> that terrible food. Anyway. But on balance for the happiness, satisfaction, inspiration that your life will have, I think that it's, it's unrealistic for the vast majority of people to think that it's going to be a gigantic cost. So I'm defending the criterion of having evidence that it is more likely true than any alternative. That's the first anticipated response. The second anticipated response, which I will try to do quickly, if I don't finish it, I'll be happy to, to continue it to, uh, next, tomorrow afternoon at 4.30, is this. Uh, the critic will say, if I believe X, you have a right to ask me why I believe it, what my evidence for X is, if I disbelieve X, you have a right to ask me why I disbelieve it. But you see, Rabbi, I don't believe it and I don't disbelieve it. I'm an agnostic. I just don't know. I honestly confess my ignorance. Surely, if I don't make any claims, if I haven't taken any position, surely then I can't be asked to justify my ignorance. And therefore, a question of evidence and probability just doesn't arise. That's a mistake. Again, for two reasons. Let's start with a direct abstract reason. Suppose someone told you that he's an agnostic about the Holocaust. Gosh, you know, there's all this mountain of evidence that it really did happen, but then there are all those people who say that it didn't happen. I just don't know. I haven't been able to make up my mind. I'm an agnostic. Would you consider that to be a, an appropriate position? I think the person is either grossly irrational or he's betraying prejudice. It isn't as if there's real evidence on both sides. On the one side, there's a mountain of evidence. On the other side, there are people who are either vicious anti-Semites or mentally incompetent or both. <coughs> if confronting this world situation, he can't make up his mind that the Holocaust happened, then he isn't paying attention to the evidence and his agnosticism is wrong. Agnosticism is appropriate when either there's a lack of evidence, or the evidence is reasonably balanced, but not when the evidence is overwhelmingly on one side over the other. So just to say I don't have any position doesn't free a person from the necessity of considering the evidence and analyzing it and seeing where the weight of the evidence lies. Secondly, I think that people who claim to be agnostics often um, don't act consistently with what they claim their intellectual position to be. Let's take an example. Imagine that there's a rumor that the Jerusalem water supply has been poisoned. So you go to George, who lives in Jerusalem, and you say to him, George, you know, what do you think? So George says, well, the city government hasn't affirmed or denied it. Of course, they don't get up till 11 o'clock, so we don't know what they'll say at 12 o'clock. Um, on the other hand, rumors like this don't float every day. I really don't know. And as he's telling you this, he walks over to the sink, opens up the tap, and takes, pours a glass of water, and drinks it down. Wouldn't you think that odd behavior? If he really doesn't know whether or not? Now, a person who says, I don't really know whether or not Sinai occurred, and let's suppose that's his only question. 
He doesn't know where the sign that occurred. For him, it's 50-50. 50-50. I would expect him to play it safe. I wouldn't expect to find him at the beach on Saturdays with a cookout with the bacon cheeseburgers. Because maybe there is a creator who said you have to keep Shabbos. Somehow, all the agnostics are at the beach. And I, I find that a little odd in terms of behavior. Now, I said it's 50-50. Make sure your question takes into account the assumption that it's 50-50. It does. Yeah. Um, but what if you're an agnostic that, you know, like right now, I don't know. Right now, I you know, make cheeseburgers at the beach. But maybe, you know, someday I'll do enough research and I'll, you know, someday I'll kind of like stop being agnostic. Maybe I won't have 100% evidence or whatever, but like someday I'll decide to be a good Jew and then I'll stop eating cheeseburgers and God will forgive me for all my days of being unsure and being ignorant. And well, let's see. I, one people. of the things that God uh, expects people to do is to be reasonable. Now, let's suppose you have in your responsibility to care for a child. And there's some evidence that the child has a certain disease. And let's say, according to what you can see, it's 50-50. And suppose you say, well, it's only 50-50. Someday I'll investigate. In the meantime, I'm not treating the child as if he's sick. Because someday I'll investigate it. And people will forgive me because I didn't know he was sick. Well, the question is, so, the question is, like, if this child's disease, like, say, if you start curing him, like, 10 years later, but he won't suffer at all, and he'll be, like, fully cured anyway, if you start 10 years rather than if you start now. I mean, the question is, if, if I become religious 10 years from now, is it possible that I could, like, you know, reach a similar spiritual level and all this stuff? And Certainly not, number one. But, so, but, but more than that, a person has a responsibility to use the partial information that he has in a rational way. Uh, we hold the people uh, to this responsibility throughout life. It's true that if there were no consequences whatsoever, then you could put it off. That's, that's quite correct. But all of that lifetime in between, it makes a difference how you live. If there is a God and he wants you to live in a particular way, then during that period of time, um, you aren't living the way he wants you to live. You know, Bertrand Russell, when they asked him, what if you die and you, and you go to heaven and there is a God, you know, what will you tell him? And he said, I'll tell him, not enough evidence! You didn't give me enough evidence! Okay. I think that's a reasonable claim, if it's true. And of course, he was talking about Christianity. There, it might very well be true. But uh, if there is enough evidence to make a decision to act on that basis, then you can't claim not enough evidence. Now, when the consequences are there and inescapable, and you have a 50-50 proposition, people expect you to, p to play it safe. People expect you to, uh, to, to, uh, to act conservatively, not to, not, to, not to just take chances. That's... And God could say the same thing. You wouldn't have done that with your stock account. You wouldn't have done that with your children. Why did you do it with me? Yeah. I, I, I would have thought, I mean, I agree, like, if it's 50-50, you would think people to take the conservative route. But I, I would think that most people, if it's 50-50, would think that, you know, the material pleasure uh, would outweigh the seeming sacrifice of a religious life given a 50-50 choice. I mean, if I thought it was only 50-50, I would be on the beach eating cheeseburgers for sure. I mean, like I said, this is a religious guy. Like, 50-50 wouldn't be enough for me. Okay, I didn't, I didn't speak about what the, what the consequences are on the other side. I, I'm assuming that the existence of a creator of the universe who wants something done weighs more than the pleasure of a cheeseburger. I think in most people's minds, you know, you ask people, suppose you were there at Sinai. Suppose you heard it yourself, right? Would that change your plans for the weekend? Yeah. Or would you say, oh, well, you know, that's what he wants, but I, I, I have a skiing trip. And I'll do it next week. Of course it would, right? So the question of what outweighs what is not, is not a question here. It's clear that if it's true, it outweighs the beach. Now you have a 50-50 chance that it's true. Okay, think about it. We'll try, pick it up tomorrow afternoon.